Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome to our first Housing Commission meeting of 2024. Um, I would like to make a motion um, to make a change to the agenda. Um, call the commission received a draft letter on source of fund protection. Um, and I would like to motion to add that to the agenda um, after number three, which is the red line in. Um, and before number four, which is the annual report. Do I have a second? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, any up? Any opposition? Okay. Um, thank you very much. And with that, let's move into public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, I think we just have one public comment. One public comment here. Alice Hogan. Alice, are you on the line? She's not on okay. the line. Um, well, if she joins later, then if there's an opportunity. Um, so uh, with no public comment then, and unless there's any other public comment in the group. Um, okay, you're done. Let's move on to approval of notes from the last meeting. Um, did anyone have any edits or changes to the notes? Were we online or in person? That people were online. It was virtual. Let's it says, oh, he says present in person, but present. Is that correct? I'll, I can, I can edit that. Okay. Language maker is correct. Any other edits? Okay, hearing none, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, uh, do I have a second? Okay, uh, and any opposition to approving the minutes with the, uh, with the edit? Okay. okay, hearing none, they are approved, thank you. Um, and moving into the red line in action item. You can go start. Um, so, hey, so oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Melissa Donowski. You can go first unless you wanted to. It's it's fine either way. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry. I think I was going to present first, and then I can transfer it to you if that's okay. Perfect. Go right ahead. Thanks so much. So, just one moment while I uh, put the presentation up on the screen and get settled. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see this. Yep. Thank you. So, so my name is Melissa Donowski and I'm with the Housing Division. I have a short presentation before turning it over to the applicant who also has a brief presentation. Um, and so let's get to it. So the site is located on the north side of Arlington Boulevard or Route 50 along Fairfax Drive, east of its intersection with North Pier Street. The site plan amendment includes the existing 141 room Red Line Hotel, which was originally constructed in the 1950s and substantially renovated and expanded in the 80s. And the site also contains the currently vacant 14 unit Ellis Arms Apartments and the 14 unit Williamsburg Apartments at the corner of Fairfax Drive and North Pier Street. The applicant or partners proposes to redevelop the site into a multifamily residential building containing 446 residential units. The Special Affordable Housing Dis Protection District, or SAHPD, is a general land use plan or GLUP policy and overlay district on the GLUP map. The SAHPD policy requires the one-for-one -one replacement of existing low and moderate income housing units on sites that are seeking to redevelop at 3.24 FAR or higher. Replacement can be achieved by providing units, bedrooms, or gross floor area equivalent to the units, bedrooms, GFA that would be lost. The site plan proposal triggers the SHPD policy due to the proposed redevelopment of the total 28 market rate affordable units or marks in the Ellis Arms and Williamsburg apartment buildings into a new multifamily building, which will be 
4.59 FAR. The applicant's SHPD proposal would replace the 28 demolished units containing 42 bedrooms at the Ellis Arms and Williamsburg apartments with 22 new units with 42 bedrooms. The proposal replaces the bedrooms on a one-for-one -one basis and also helps meet affordable housing master plan goals for additional family-sized units by including two additional two-bedroom units and two new three-bedroom units. And so please note that this proposal has been revised just this afternoon by the applicant um, from that handout you may have received last week to incorporate an additional three bedroom unit. And the bedrooms remain replaced on a one for one basis. So rents and income levels for the 22 affordable units will be affordable up to 60% area median income. However, those who specifically live at Williamsburg apartments and earn up to 80% AMI can also be income qualified to return to a new CAF with rents up to 60% AMI. So in other words, the rent will remain at 60% AMI. For residents who may earn up to 80% and live at Williamsburg Apartments can still return to the property if they choose to do so. And at least two of the units in the project are required to be fully accessible to persons with physical disabilities. And the, the proposed site plan would achieve the county's replacement objectives by providing on-site affordable units through the base density um, according to the zoning ordinance 15.5.8a uh, and also 15.5.8i, um, which states uh, site plan applications that result in the elimination of existing affordable housing will address replacement of the housing in the process of the county board's consideration of the approval of the plan and also additional density per 15.5.9 um, as well. So the proposed redevelopment uh, would include the demolition of existing residential units. So as such, the relocation of existing residents will be necessary. The applicant will submit and obtain approval of a tenant relocation plan prior to the issuance of demolition and land disturbing activity permits. The tenant relocation plan will be considered by the Tenant Landlord Commission. And the tenant relocation plan will detail the relocation payments and services eligible residents will receive and will be in accordance with the Arlington County tenant relocation guidelines. Any relocated tenant wishing to return to the redeveloped property will be given priority and relocation assistance before leasing efforts commence in the new building. In consistence with the county's tenant assistance fund policy, a TAF will be used to assist eligible residents who desire to return to a newly developed CAF at the site. The TAF will help pay increases in rent while the eligible resident lives off-site during the construction period, provided the off-site location is within Arlington and under the maximum allowed rent amount. <laughs> the TAF will be available for one year uh, after construction completion as well. So eligible households are those earning up to 60% AMI and who do not currently receive rental assistance. And a TAF funding allocation um, would be considered by the County Board wants eligibility and number of residents wishing to return to the new development has been determined. Uh, the County Board adopted an equity resolution in September 2019. Um, the resolution includes in part direction to apply a racial equity lens for every project and specifically staff asks the following questions when considering racial impacts of county projects. Who benefits? Who's burdened? Who's missing? How do we know? And what do we do? The 2021 American Community Survey five-year estimate data for racial composition for the census tract where the site plan is located indicates this area has about the same white population as the county as a whole, but varying diversity for other racial categories. For example, there is a smaller percentage of the Black population than the county as a whole, but a higher population of Asian, multiracial, and combined populations and Hispanic or Latina origin populations in the census tract where the site plan is located compared to the county as a whole. And the proposed 22 on-site CAS will benefit and enable income eligible families to live in an area of the county nearby Metro and other community amenities. In terms of who is burdened, the proposed units will be affordable up to 60% AMI and may not be affordable to households with very low incomes and who may not be eligible for housing grants or housing choice vouchers. For this reason, one could say that very low income households are missing from this opportunity as well, since these households may not have access to living units if they're still unaffordable. However, a TAF will be available to eligible residents currently living at Williamsburg Apartments. We know this information based on the census tract information for this geographic area as compared to the rest of the county. 
And in terms of what we do, the county has an opportunity to consider the site plan's proposed affordable housing program in light of these potential benefits and impacts. So to conclude, staff recommends approval of the affordable housing program, which meets the SAHPD policy and includes 22 committed affordable units, um, four one-bedroom units, 16 two-bedroom units, and two three-bedroom units. And with that, I can turn it over to the applicant uh, for their brief presentation. Uh, good evening, Nicholas Cummings here with Walsh Colucci. I'm a land use attorney uh, on behalf of the applicant or partners. I'm joined here by uh, Tyler Orr next to me and uh, David Orr back there. Also, Bernie Sur uh, Suchasil from my office as well. Um, we're excited to bring you the Red Line project today for consideration. Some of you might be aware, although I think the body of this group has changed since 2019. Um, that there was a former approval on this site. That project included a small condominium and a new hotel. Uh, given the difficulty in the hospitality market during COVID, that proposal just didn't get forward to construction. Fortunately, however, or partners stepped in. They joined with the hotel uh, owners to bring you the application you're reviewing today, which is for a single multifamily building delivering uh, 446 much needed residential units to the neighborhood. Of those units, uh, 22 will be committed affordable housing, including two three-bedroom units, 16 two-bedroom units, which is you know an important need for multi-size, multi-family size, excuse me, affordable housing. Now, one thing I want to highlight, and that uh, Tyler or uh, Mr. David or my one do. Um, last night at the planning commission, we had some comments and a lot of you know praise for obviously the strong effort we made here, the size of the commitment uh, to affordable housing here, but. There was a question of whether or not we could adjust the unit mix to deliver um, a little bit more on the family sized units um, and maybe take out some of the ones. And so what we did was vote to, and this was all today, which was exciting. But the ORs uh, sharpened their pencils, went back and took a look at the unit mix and how we could adjust things. And they ended up adding another three bedroom unit to the portable commitment um, and out some one bedrooms. So that extra three bedroom. So what that's going to do is just give you another um, large family sized unit here, which I think is going to be really helpful. Another thing to think about that's important is that the Williamsburg apartments and the Alice Arms apartments, the two market rate existing buildings on site, um, you know, those units in those buildings that were built in like the 50s are much, much smaller than the units that um, folks are going to enjoy in the new building. So everybody who is going from, for example, a two bedroom in the existing building to a two bedroom in the new building is going to have a just vastly better experience. So that's a huge upgrade there too. And I'll note as well that one of the prongs of the special affordable housing protection policy is, you know, you can do replacement on a GFA for GFA basis, a square footage basis, or on a bedroom basis or on a unit for unit basis. And, you know, there's a push and pull with the county when you discuss these things. and if we had gone with the square footage replacement, we would have seen far fewer units, but the ORs were able to make a much bigger commitment to satisfy the policy in a way that brought the most housing to Arlington County, which I think is really special about this project, really made it a priority here in the community benefit package. The other thing, of course, to remember is that the, the new building is going to be vastly different than the existing buildings in the scope of amenities, right? The sort of things that everybody gets to enjoy. It's an affordable unit in the new building, is the same as any other unit in the building, for instance, what people get to enjoy there. And while amenity packages are certainly something that we finalize and figure out as we're moving closer to construction, I have heard a lot from the war team about the sorts of things they're planning to be building. Um, and I think it's going to be really nice and special. And in the presentation, you'll at least see some of the outdoor areas with the swimming pool and areas to sort of sit and hang out outside and all that, which is uh, really nice. The other thing just to mention briefly, um, this was more important for the planning commission, but I want to mention it to you all too, is you know, we really worked hard with staff on this application to, uh, and with the site plan review committee to improve it. We got staff comments and comments from the SPRC, all of which led to a better project at the end of the day, particularly from the SPRC it was on building design. But with staff, it was um, both before and after we submitted, we had to make significant to us, especially changes to the building. So we actually had to shrink the floor plate by moving the building back to allow the county to be able to build. What you can see in this rendering, we tried to capture it, is there's going to be a new bike path along Route 50 there under along Fairfax Drive. 
the county's going to be building that, but once they realized this project was coming forward, there was also some attention to other properties up the street. Um, they realized they had to design uh, the new bike path and figure out what the new alignment of Fairfax Drive was going to be. Then they realized after VDOT sort of refused to give, which is not surprising, a little bit of space under 50, that they were going to need more out of uh, Fairfax Drive and out of our site than we had originally assumed. So we had to go back. Um, pull the building back, which is always painful for any developer, um, and make adjustments. But we were happy to do it. That bike path thing is going to be really helpful for both our residents and everyone. Um, those are some of the big picture stuff that I wanted to highlight. And then uh, Tyler here is going to go over the building design. Yeah, so just starting with the building design, we really had a great effort with the entire SBRC process. So I think came away with a much better building than we originally added. Had. Um, we have a lot of brick kind of throughout the lower levels and then each out panels going up the rest of the project. And she also brought in some significant biofill, such as the planted canopy that you can see right at the entrance and all the planting around the pool deck. So there's there's three core guards in this entire project and planting all around, which you'll see on your slide. Um, as far as community benefit goes, so we're looking for on this project. We're going to set that our 3.5, the three extra items we used or chose from were the building site cycle impact reduction, advanced energy metering, procurement of offsite solar, and also meeting baseline requirements. So here you can kind of see our, uh, our pool deck on the right in E. Um, e is our rooftop amenity, which will be like a grill area doing deck. C is this tranquil interior courtyard where it's just quiet, peaceful. It's got like a little fire ring and just a place for serenity. Then D is just another planted area. And obviously we have the planting all around the project. Don't forget the dog run. Oh, I forget. Yeah, I did forget the dog run, which is F. And getting into some biophilic elements as well. So one. One big piece that we heard from the county staff was about the transformer vaults. We have like three big doors that are for where our transformers are going to sit. We brought in some biophilic elements. Um, C, D, where we have, we wanted to implement some tree, like a design of trees to kind of just hide that massing behind it. And we used some imagery from, uh, trees in uh, Hillside Park. Then we also brought in, see it better here, this uh, interesting planted canopy that I'm actually really excited about. I think it really brings interesting design that you don't really see too often. And it's going to give you more just because one of the main points for the county staff was that you don't really, the, the main entrance was getting kind of lost in the long facade that we have. So we really highlighted we wanted to do this planted canopy similar to the one um, see on the top that's from New York City. That yeah, ready for questions. Thank you very much for the presentation both from staff and after Um and we have one speaker and I didn't know it looks like Alice is on if Alice also wanted to to speak <clears throat> on this application um now that she's on or um Okay, Thank let's you, go ahead. Kellen, are oh. you are you calling on me, Kellen? Uh, I was just wondering, Alice, since you weren't here for the public comment at the start, if you had any comments on the red line in action item or no. I did. Thank you. OK, um, Alice, we'll have you go after Stuart. Thank you. Okay. I'm here speaking to for my Heights Commitment Association. And our first concern is for our neighbors that will be displaced by this project. We were very happy to see that the developer was concerned about them and interested in helping to give them every opportunity to live in the new. Building. I believe very strongly that the current residents of a market affordable unit should not have to rely on the kindness of developers or to be lucky enough to get a developer that cares, such as this one. For years, I have asked the county to guarantee the of current residents to return 
at the rate that they left, especially when bonus is involved. Mm -hmm. If so few residents remain, there is no reason that each and every one of them should not be given this opportunity, even if they don't fit fully into the cap guidelines. Uh, I see that some adjustments have been made for that, and that is greatly appreciated. It is not just about units, uh, it's about people. My, it's about my neighbors, it's about our neighbors. Use uh, what we hope that county will use whatever tools they have and if necessary, modify them, such as what we've done with AMI. And if uh, the a AMI for the current uh, renters are too little, then further subsidy for current residents, while we would always hope to include units at the lower AMIs, I think the, the uh, contribution of this developer is admirable at 60 AMI for the long term. Perhaps it is uh, time for the county to do its part. Maybe something can be done with the base contribution that they've uh, been recovering from uh, site plan projects over the years. Sure, to make sure that none of the Arlington County citizens are sacrificed in the name of affordable. I went once again, I want once again to thank the developer for their concern and their efforts to prevent the displacement of my neighbors. If we can't act as a county and work with willing and caring developer to help a small group of Arlingtonians who are being impacted by this development, then when will we be able to do so? There was a discussion of the bedroom mix. I see the adjustment was made, and we would be concerned though that that adjustment doesn't adversely impact, because I know you had seven and seven currently, uh, the ability of anyone to return. Made for that. Uh, over the years, I've been told it is the business of various entities, planning commission, housing commission, tenant landlord, or county board, each one speaking about another one usually. I would say there is not a more important group than the housing commission when it comes to this matter, and I can't think of a group that would care as much about the impacts of housing policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, Alice. Thank you. I'm Alice Hogan. I'm with the Alliance for Housing Solutions. Um, I just wanted to point out that the fact that we have this special exception, um, special affordable housing uh, protection district is a wonderful tool. And this is an example of why we're getting to preserve these units. Um, and so, you know, kudos to planners in the past and for all those who have worked um, on yet another tool uh, to benefit Arlington residents. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Uh, I wondered when the tenant relocation plan um, is going to the TLC and also what um, what um, correspondence has occurred with the current tenants to this point. Um, you mentioned a TAF, which is excellent, another tool we've worked hard for in the county. And I wondered who's actually responsible for funding that TAF. Um, and my final question is about supporting the CAF residents once they come in. So normally we get, you know, a few units here, a few units there with 22 units. That's a good size, um, you know, sub population within this building. And are there any plans for um, special consideration or resident services of any kind for folks on this lower income level that may have different needs than the market rate renters? Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, and I'm happy to, to let the applicant respond to Alice's questions. Yeah, I'll start um, and then I'm going to take her to Tyler. Um, the tenant relocation plan, we actually. Does. So we'll go through a draft or two with him and then it will go to the tenant uh, land board commission. At some point after the case is approved, that is actually something that is typically developed post approval and then you know, goes through the process. But we already had one for uh, Ellis Arms uh, and we adapted it to this property as well. And went ahead and submitted it early just to get ahead of the process. We're fairly organized on that front. Uh, Tyler, you can speak to the communication. Yeah, so as far as communication with tenants, I personally went and knocked on the door. Did meet with everyone, but I met with everyone that 
answered the door and communicated that there are these different programs that go through the TAP and tenant relocation plan that's going to be coming. Advise them that that we're going to be redeveloping the property and kind of explain different uh, programs that are going to be available to them so that they can at least take advantage of. I, I think Mr. Orr, uh, Mr. Capo mentioned uh, yesterday to which is important is that you know several tenants are fulfilling one but they're not forcing this so really that important to well I, I if I may Mr. Chet yeah, please I think that that's an understatement and I, I do want to register the following and that is from the we've been working on this project for about two years and our neighbors at Belvedere have been have been really um, very, they've been, been very encouraging and concerned about their neighbors, and it registered with us from day one. And so we have not, we purposely not enforced these systems. We have been working with these people for several years now, really to help them with the transition both out and back in. And we've tried to demonstrate that with our community benefits and working with Melissa, who's really a great champion for the county with Way she administers the affordable housing program, and just today, we had an appeal yes last night from from Mr. Stein um, about can we adjust the affordability requirement, the income requirements of the people coming back, and so we made an adjustment with Melissa today on that, and then and then also can we get more family size units, and so. We ran the numbers today and we're able to take it and go to a second, a second three bedroom unit in combination with the balance of uh, two bedroom units and one bedroom. Unit. So we have, so we are predominantly family sized units. So we, I, you know, I just wanted to say that we've been listening to the community all along. We've taken these things very seriously and we've tried to employ them very from our heart and, and our caring and empathy, everybody in, the, in this process. Thank you, all of you for that support. Thank you for clarification. Um, two things now 22 units and not 24 that are caps. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that's because of the shift to the three bed. And then the affordability adjustment. Can you guys clarify what that was again? I think I missed that. Well, I'll let Melissa answer that. Uh, okay. It has to do with the uh, assistance at return and threshold for getting the assistance. Go ahead, Melissa. Sure. So a question came up at the Planning Commission meeting last night about can residents that live at Williamsburg Apartments that may earn 60 to 80 percent AMI return to a new CAF unit? Now, the rents at the new CAF units will be up to 60 percent AMI. And uh, in order to income qualify, residents will also have to earn 60 percent AMI, except if you're a resident at Williamsburg Apartments, then you can income qualify up to 80 percent AMI. So it allows more residents at Williamsburg Apartments to return to a new unit if they desire to do so. Right. Okay. And is that so? Once those residents move out, it just goes back to sixty percent. Exactly. Special for me, I call <clears throat> folks who might because it's market rate affordable, so you don't necessarily know everybody's in that real time. So they build it, and there's a chance that some might get higher. Okay. Um, so just out of curiosity, do you know what the mix of income is currently at the Williamsburg? We do not have that. We're not privy to that information. OK, just thought I'd ask. Yeah, I have a second question, which is completely unrelated. What is bird friendly glass? Okay. So um, there's a requirement mm -hmm. in the county, as you know, a lot of birds hit glass and it's right, they get stunned or they snap their neck. Um, there's a requirement in the county that up to, I believe it's 34 feet in height. We have to have glass that the birds can see out of the way. So it either, it, what it typically has is a special frit in the graph, in the glass that helps the reflectivity of it so that they can see it and avoid it. Okay. Now, the communication you mentioned about the options, was that during non-business hours? Uh, so it, it was it was in the middle of the day because a lot of our, our residents actually work night shifts okay. and kind of different hours. So we felt it was the best time at night to close again. There's actually so one person actually rents three of the units. We're able to meet her and then um, 
we were able to meet another person, younger gentleman, I, I forget his name off the top of my head, but he was able, he knew a lot of the people with the building, so he was going to communicate for us as well. Yeah. Surprise everyone. I think, Tyler, you people. met with 12 of the 14 units. Yeah. 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 Thirteen. There's only thirteen. Thirteen occupied right now. Yeah. There's something yeah. like that. It's whatever answers. Like yeah. Yeah. I was just points. curious on the time. And then will there be any written communications? Yes. I assume that's part of the relocation. Yeah. There are yeah. specific yeah. requirements right. in that. Obviously, I'm following all of that. Yeah. What's nice too is they've got both our partners who's very, very good at this sort of thing, but also Van Meter, I think, is the property yeah. manager there, and they're another company that knows what they're doing. So. We've got multiple layers of professionals to make sure everything is executed correctly. We've already identified, and immediately identified two properties. Yeah. We, we can go put these truck. people, Park Roslyn and Park George have, um, where they can go while they wait for us to get the construction done and actually come back. I, I do wish yeah. that um, the relocation guides required the demographic like, survey. Um, I wish for projects like this that we have that information at this stage as opposed to later when it goes to the TLC um, as part of the relocation process. Is that on that? It's just helpful. <laughs> I feel like when we're trying to understand the population for existing, you know, units that are being redeveloped um, to have that before we make our decision. I didn't see it and maybe I overheard it. Um, do you have retail at the bottom? What was the, um, the reason behind that? The ORs are very good at answering this question, but it is, I probably am too. Um, it's just not a great spot for retail and okay. retail is suffering a lot of places and concentrating in the busiest parts of the county is the best way to ensure that the business actually survives. Except for the taco truck. That is yeah. <laughs> I love that thing. One of my colleagues brought me there in my first few months of working. Yeah, yeah. kind of started. Yeah, <laughs> like introduced me to. Yeah. What's the what's the process? Uh, and maybe this is including the tenant relocation plan. If there's twelve current tenants in a one bedroom who all want to stay, come redevelopment, but now there's only seven one bedrooms. How does that look? Yeah. Um, does that happen? I mean, I mean, that... Melissa, I think you might be able to help us a bit on this just because that does get into sort of how, you know, affordable units get rented in the county. I think that here we have how many occupied one bedrooms? Six, six out of seven. Six out of seven. So we have six occupied one bedrooms, and then I think we have four. Yeah, I, I meant in the commitment oh. for the uh, building. Right. There's only there's four. So I mean, there is like a difference there. Mm -hmm. I will say that in reality, and a lot of folks, you know, housing can speak to this. That and Hector did um, was in charge of these relocation plans to the county during the SBRC process. But the number of folks are actually not coming back is actually not 100. So it should work out such that mm -hmm. anybody who wants to come back is very likely to be able to get a spot. Um, and the change that we made was to get the yeah. And so we got um, that extra three bedroom in there, which reduces the number of ones that we're doing, but at the same time, very likely to work out. I think someone had made a comment, one of the public commenters, um, about having a, um, a decent amount of cap units within this market rate building. Um, there's a decent amount of studies out there about how like there can be cultural differences that can make it challenging for low income residents to feel comfortable in a uh, mixed income building. Um, they generally feel like if there's a, an association that like they don't get to set the rules, they're made by wealthier people who may have different norms. Um, one of the things that I would urge you guys to look into is similar things that um, our nonprofit like CAP partners do like um, eviction prevention plans. Um, you know, that could be setting thresholds like if someone owes less than $500, um, we'll work with them. We don't do eviction proceedings until they hit a certain threshold. Just understanding that, you know, low, low income people have different challenges than your market rate units. Um, <clears throat> and 
just looking into if there's policies like that that you guys can put in place. Granted, that's not your primary mission is to to serve low income um, residents, but um, I would definitely encourage you to look at you know where you can make policies or um, do things to, um, especially the residents who do come back, have them feel like this is still their home and they have a say in how things are are run, what activities may be available in in like the common spaces or things like that. Um, anything you can do on that, I think would be beneficial to having them feel like you know, this is still their home as opposed to there's a whole bunch of hundreds of other people who make a lot more money who are now here um, and feeling like it's not their place anymore. Oh, one thing I'll say is uh, there was a question earlier too about um, services specific to affordable residents, but Mark Roslin right next door is a community affordable building. I think it's Tampa managed. Um, sure that the orders can reach out and see if there's any opportunity to get some sharing of like um, the sort of just support services that might be offered there to allow some of their tenants in there but think back about how to welcome folks that would be fantastic um the number of units 426 and then the affordable units how many not like market rate are bedrooms or bedrooms? So I know off the top of my head that of the uh, three bedroom units, I think we've got two of the six. Is it six total or is it seven? It is it's six. So two of the six three bedrooms are committed affordable. Um, I think this is still accurate. Yeah. And then we have 155 total twos, like true two bedrooms. So. Um, the significant give is three bedrooms, really, because folks, generally speaking, developers are reluctant to give us up because they're, they're big, right? And rents are quite high. Um, so that to me was a big concession to see that come from this development. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, I see that you are using the green building incentive policy, and you're on the level two out of five of that. Um, I was wondering, uh, I, I know you said you had electric car charging. Um, like I was wondering, like how many of those stations out of the garage are going to be um, either having the chargers or be able to be converted to electric chargers? So it's four percent um, day one, so and then nineteen percent total when it comes to a total of eleven spaces uh, day one, and then thirty nine future. Okay. All level two. Yeah, all level two chargers. Driving electric trucks. <laughs> frustrates me when they're not level two. Yeah, they're all going to be level two. My planner behind me just got the Ford hatchback, and I'm jealous. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like any other questions from the commissioners? Um, oh, I think there was a question that Alice had asked that I, I was curious about the answer about the tap, and I believe that's county funded. That's not the applicant does not pay for the tap. Okay. Yes, okay. that the TAF is would be a uh, AF allocation. And that allocation would be made once we learn a little bit more about um, the uh, residents income levels and their desire to move back to a new unit at the new development. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, um, do I have a motion? Would someone like to make a motion? Okay. To um to approve to approve. Okay. Uh, proposal does. as it's been presented to us this evening. Okay. With, the, with the corrections that were I think were not even corrections, they were okay. discussion, enhancing. including discussion in the letter. Yeah. Yeah. Um do we have a second? Okay. Um let's see roll call for this. Um okay. Let's start with uh Commissioner Blake. Uh Commissioner Montgomery. Yes. Commissioner Surface? Yes. Commissioner Norris? Yes. Commissioner Wenger? Yes. Commissioner Rubelkabel? Yes. Commissioner Blake? Uh, I already said it. Okay, yep. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Escobar is not. Uh, Commissioner McGilbray? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Lenick? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Great. It passes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this is a great project. Yeah. You're great. Huh.
but this group uh, seems younger than it is. Uh, <laughs> which is good. I think he's online. People of my generation is here. We're just getting old. <laughs> yeah, that's what you say. Oh, yeah. It goes like. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're definitely not old. If you're that <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to our next agenda item. Okay, so our next item on the agenda. Uh, if we could, if we could cut back on the side conversation. Well, I don't know. It hasn't been two hours. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next item is the source of funds protection. Uh, resolution letter uh, to the county board. Um, so I think Alex emailed this out with the center. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. Are you able to bring it up on the screen? We can go grab it. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I, um, <laughs> uh, if you can scroll down to just the, the main text. Um, so uh, just a little introduction on this. Um, this kind of stems from a uh, conversation I had with Christian Dorsey a couple of months ago, probably in November, um, where I'd asked for an update on uh, amending the human rights ordinance to add source of funds protection. Um, so the Virginia General Assembly added this as a protected class in 2020. Um, and at that point, the county was able to add it to our human rights ordinance so that our local Office of Human Rights could begin enforcing this um, housing protection. They have not yet done so, um, and it has been a frustratingly slow process. Every time I ask for updates, there's always some reason, oh, because of we're waiting for the county attorney's office or we're waiting for this and that it's been three years and the county has not been enforcing this this right and this protection um which frustrates me greatly <laughs> christian suggested why don't you do a standalone letter to the board to just remind us um he's no longer on the board but you know at the time to remind us that this is important um and you know maybe that can help speed things up um so because of that, I drafted this letter um, that just kind of, again, explains what I just said. Um, also, um, the fair housing plan that was approved by the board last year that we considered also says that the county, you know, needs to add source of funds protection to the human rights ordinance. Um, it's a, it's a quick and easy change to the ordinance. It's not complicated. It's just making it consistent with state law. Um, and it's just has not been a priority um, because if it was, it would have been done by now. Um, so I would like the Housing Commission to send this reminder to the board that we value um, having this protection um, in the human rights ordinance. Uh, and we think that the board should move quickly to make that happen. Discussion questions. So if someone um, files a fair housing complaint, not through Arlington, but through Federally, then they are getting that protection. Federally, no. So only, only Virginia. So you would have to. The, so the, they would have to file with the Virginia Office of Fair Housing. Okay. Um, get that and protection. They can right enforce now. it. Okay. But if they file it locally through the county, they won't. They get don't it. get that protection. And federally, it's not a. Okay. And also, federal like HUD does not recognize it either. Um, yeah. So it's only through the Virginia Office. Uh, do you really summarize the, the reason why it wasn't enforced? So in the same uh, General Assembly session, they also added sexual orientation and gender identity. County, probably a week after that went effective, uh, became effective, added gender identity. Um, it was just that was a priority. Not to say I'm glad that they did that. Sexual orientation was already in our uh, human rights ordinance. Um, and we predated the uh, the state in doing that, but this 
just wasn't a priority like the other protections have been. Um, and this one, I think is incredibly important because um, the housing choice voucher program, housing grants and other like subsidized income things, they're less effective programs if you're limiting where people can can use them. And having talked to landlords who flat out have told me I will never allow someone who has a house interest voucher to rent in my building. This is a very important protection. Um, and to make sure that those landlords know, like, no, you have to, just because someone gets income from a different source, you still have to, um, you know, treat them like you would any other renter. Um, so I think this is very important. Um, it doesn't impact a ton of people because we have about like 1,500 people um, with housing choice vouchers and a little like 1,400 with housing grants. Um, but it would also be veterans benefits and any other type of like um, income other than like a you know retirement or, or uh, W two or something. That sounds great. We agree. Why don't we change the date on it though? May 10th. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is uh, the template from an old letter, and I messed up the date, <laughs> but that will change. Um, any other discussion? Are there other? Um, well, I guess two things. One, are there any other protected class, uh, protected categories, in state law, not including the county? There's one other. Um, it's military status, and I think Arlington has veteran status, but not military. And this one, not to say that I don't think that's important. It's slightly more complicated, um, and so I wanted to focus on source of funds. Um, yeah. Uh, the other one also? Yeah, they're both uh, housing um, discrimination protected classes. Um, but the veteran versus military, like, yeah, I didn't want to include yeah, that yeah. and then have like the county attorney be like, well, now this makes it a little bit more complicated. And so it's going to take some time. I wanted to move forward with source of funds. I guess we bless this or do we just vote on it? Uh, just a hope. <laughs> if you'd like to. I didn't mean religious. I think it's different condition. <laughs> that kind of a blessing. It would just be a, a motion um, like, like any other. Um, do I have a motion to um, send this recommendation to the county board? Yes. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, and let's do a roll call just so that we can add it. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Blake? Yes. Commissioner Montgomery? Yes. Commissioner Surface? Yes. Commissioner Norris? Yes. Commissioner Wenger? Yes. Commissioner Rubelkava? Yes. Commissioner, I already said Blake, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sorry, you're in a minute, Spice. So. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Gilbride? Yes. And Commissioner Lennox? Yes. Thank you, Mr. McDonald's. Yes. Great. It has to be unanimously. All. Yeah. Um, next item on the agenda is the annual work. No, sorry, the annual report. Um, so hopefully people had some time to look through. I know it's 19 or 20. Yeah. I only printed two of the so many, but um, this is a labor of love that drafted. Um, but a lot of a lot of the policy section just came from our letter, so it was copy and pasting um, most of the section and just like making the format consistent um, across the board. Um, but this, uh, the format is consistent with our previous years, um, going back to like when I joined the commission. Um, yeah, did people have discussion or questions about the? Um, our plan. Sorry, um, our annual report. I guess the question is, um, how many of these uh, priorities uh, are carrying over to our work plan for twenty twenty four? I guess that's. It'll be the next agenda. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, the overall categories are the same. Um, yeah. It's just individual items that change. So, um, yeah, under like areas of focus, uh, they're they're virtually the same. 
for last year to this year. Um, and we'll get into more specifics when we talk about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the the purpose of this plan is basically to summarize for the county board, like, here's what we did and accomplished last year. Here's all the letters we sent you, some of which you read, some of which you didn't. Here's an opportunity to read the ones that maybe you didn't. Um, and I think it's also helpful for us as we're looking at what we do this year as sort of an easy reference guide to like, oh, what did we say about the budget last year? What did we ask for? It's in here. You don't have to go dig up the letter. Um, so it just consolidates things um, and gives us a record of um, what we accomplished. Um, it, so any questions or edits or comments? OK, uh, do I have a motion to approve? Okay. OK, do I have a second? OK, um, this one, I'll just, any objection to approve it? OK, passes with no objections. Thank you all. We're speeding through. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so our next item on the agenda is the 2024 plan. Um, so uh, this one, so started with the template that we used last year um, and made updates and changes. I listened to the meeting recording from December to hear who are a few things that you guys had talked about, um, and I tried to incorporate um, into the plan. Um, and I also need to send up a sign up sheet for the board meeting representation, just like we did last year, so we can identify which housing commission members are going to be um, representing the commission at county board meetings. Um, so I'll send that out so that we can have this filled in when we actually vote to approve this in February. Uh, so today's just discussion. Um, we can make hopefully edits and change to it, um, and then we can vote to actually adopt a version of it for February. Do you want me to run through it, or did everyone have a chance to kind of read through it in detail? I can give a short synopsis. Yeah. So um, key objectives again, basically starting with what first came about because of the Serrano. Um, the oversight of affordable housing properties and reviewing programs and policies to support affordable housing residents. Um, so this is updated based on what happened last year, <clears throat> uh, but it continues to, you know, say we should follow up on the implementation status of the recommendations that we made, um, as well as the strategies that staff um, committed to. We should continue to pr promote tenant empowerment, um, I think we added last year the examine strategies to advance economic ability and promote pathways out of subsidized housing, um, and then continue collaborating with the Tenant Landlord Commission and other advocates. Um, and that's what we have. One of the things that I would like to do this year is kind of create uh, a fun table of the recommendations that we made in the Serrano report to send to staff and ask them to specifically respond to like, have you taken any action on this recommendation? Because I feel like the presentations we've gotten from staff thus far have been, here's our cash strategies, like things that we've committed to. Many of these are very similar to what you recommended, um, but they have not specifically responded to each of the recommendations it's that either we're doing something about this or we're not. Um, so I'd like to send that to staff and make it easy for them to go through and say, yes, we're not doing this one, or you know, here's what we've done to implement this recommendation. Because um, there's definitely things that I know staff have not worked on and are not part of their, their work plan. Um, and there's other items that have been. So it'd be nice to have that clarification is instead of just looking at their cap strategies uh, document as the, uh, as kind of the only um, implementation like guiding. Um, and then for the maintaining and strengthening role as chief advisory commission, the county board on housing issues. Um, <clears throat> this the language of this changed slightly, and that was because the county board, um, when they amended our charter last year, 
Um, they change it so we're not the chief advisor to the county board of housing. We're the chief advisory commission, and I think they said that like the county manager is the chief advisor. So we're the chief advisory. Commission. So that that's why I had to change the language in here to be consistent with our charter. Um, so uh, the first one is working with staff to build on the progress we made last year with our equity framework um, to ensure that the data and the presentations that we get has the information that we feel like we need to be able to make those informed decisions, um, looking at you know the impact of projects and policies on historically disadvantaged communities and also knowing like, what type of consultation was done uh, with those populations. Um, see, I think I added in based on the discussion last month, identifying to disseminate best practices in the housing policy field to shape can commission discussions and recommendations. Um, and then the next bullet about county board meetings that is the same. Um, I added the bullet about ensuring that we have regular representation at the long range planning commission or committee and site plan review committee meetings. I think Alex said and about 50% of them right now. I would love to get that number up. I know it can be inconvenient from a schedule perspective for the SPRC and the LRPC meetings, but they are our best way to influence those projects um, and actually have a voice that's heard because <clears throat> by the time it gets to us, they're not making changes. Um, so if we really want things changed or we want to shape it, I think it's really important that we have people um, are at those meetings and representing the Housing Commission. All right, I just want to talk on that. Um, my only guess suggestion would be, can we have like a template We're not going in there kind of like, because I've gone in there and I'm like, uh, what do I say or how am I representing the committee? Because I know it's my first one and I think that would be helpful because there are like, people on the um, committee and if we have like meeting someone else James or stuff, but like hey these are the bullet points that we want we want you to discuss that's so much more helpful and normally they're pretty quick they're like an hour and a minute so trying to get through an hour and a half about 15 people sometimes like just yeah your points. so yeah I feel like generally you may get to say one or two things at most yes like you have a three minute that's it. Um, because you have, you know, the parks rec who also needs to talk and transfers. No, I think that's a great idea. And um, I think creating, yeah, like a one page guide or something of like, so you're a housing commission representative on the LRPC. What does that mean? Like, what what are some questions you you know may want to ask? I think that could be helpful for folks. Um, and same thing, one of the things that I've asked Alex to do for the um, was it subcommittee or development updates? Was probably development updates. Yeah, that makes sense. Is to list each of the like on the actual agenda, the SPRCs and the LRPC meetings that we've gone to, and then um, have that person give us an update during the meeting so it doesn't get overlooked because that's the other challenge that we've had is like people go and then the rest of us never hear about it. The project comes, people have questions or like, oh, what about this and it never got back to the representative who you know was attending those meetings um so i want to make sure if we have people going we're also including that in our agenda to have that discussion um and i think someone uh i think it was during december like gave a, a good update um uh michael Melwood. okay yep um and i was like yeah we should be doing that at each of our meetings um so that's one of the changes to our our agenda um, that I've asked Alex to make so that we can just incorporate that more. It doesn't get overlooked. Like I think it is. Are we able to change that kind of at all, or is it kind of set? Just so we can have like agenda items, kind of like I guess the action items, but kind of like new business, old business, so we know kind of what I make it a little bit more. I get yes, the action items and 
format, but if we don't get to the like, information ones, we know to like get to those next time, make those a priority. Okay, so just if for our next agenda, like, oh, we didn't get to development updates, we're going to do that first or something. Yeah. Like that. Okay. I would say that that works for some of the items, but there are like time, you know, lines related to a lot of the items that that wouldn't work for. I mean, and then also trying to get much more of a timed agenda. So we kind of go kind of hitting our, our objectives tonight. So we put it for two hours, but we know that there's been time to spend. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we can do that. So <laughs> when um, when I was training the tenant landlord commission, we had a set time for each item. Um, I mean, it was up to we could go over if we you know wanted to, but um, and we can start doing that. Um, this is just historically, I think, how the housing commission has done theirs, which was quite different from what I was used to on uh, different commissions. But um, yeah, we can make changes and and add you know um, timing to it. Um, I, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think we should, um, cause that's something that when we invite someone to present, um, they'll usually like how long. And if I have a say, I'll be like, you have 20 minutes. Um, and that includes questions. Sometimes they don't ask and they just show up and give presentations, but, um, yeah, yeah, no, I think that makes sense. That way we have a little bit more of an estimate. Nice. 20 yeah. minutes is a long presentation. We could probably ask yeah. people to try. <laughs> well, and I mean, the Melissa's great, but she basically read the piece of paper. So, like, we already had a lot of the information that she gave us by the presentation. So, we can shorten that a little bit. And it's also for us, too, right? Like, right now, unfortunately, a lot of the event for me. I mean, I'd prefer more time on discussion than on presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Especially if we have the information in hand. Yeah. But not every like this is also public, and not everyone has seen the right. info. So I do think you know that plays a. Part. It's our commission. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean we can certainly look at a way to balance that out. Um, and I think setting time limits can help, and and especially for presenters. You have 10 minutes or you have whatever. Um, so Alex, let's work for the next agenda to, to figure that out. Um, uh, yeah, and part of it is like. I have some control of the agenda, <laughs> but like a lot of it is like this will be on the agenda for the Housing Commission and it's decided by powers that be. Like if it doesn't do this month, yeah. well, and the site we'll go to the county board. Yeah, exactly. We see the county board scene, so. Yeah. Um, but and no, they, I think that's what it's, they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the pecking order. Um, OK, uh, any other you know, questions or comments on the like LRPC, SPRC things? I think the guide. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, sort of similar to what Sarah was saying around like a template, like is there opportunities for us to like collaborate with them like in advance of their yeah. meetings, the other committees? Like SPRC, I guess. Because if you if you're saying that like by the time it comes here, like everything's already decided, like should we be really get, trying to get her earlier somehow? And if we only have like a minute at SPRC, I mean you you have more than a minute generally, but like you may only have like one or two opportunities to speak, um, and so you should be very prepared for questions. You can also send questions like after. Um, like, it's not like it's like, oh, that's it. Like, this was your one opportunity, but it's really up to the representative from the Housing Commission. Like, they are representing us, so we don't really get a say. Um, it's just that person. But if if the Housing Commission representative felt like they needed more information or, you know, they need to have side conversations, like, yeah, they can always talk to the chair of that SPRC. Um, to be like, hey, I'd really like to sit down with the applicant to talk about X. Um, I'm, I'm sure they'd be willing to accommodate that, but it's just not a normal you know, part of the process. But the key thing is, in order to do any of that, we have to have someone there. And that's what we've struggled with is 
having actual representation on the LRPCs and um, SPRCs. And in part because we don't set the schedule, you know, like it's controlled by the planning commission. Um, and you guys usually send it to us as soon as you know when it's going to happen, right? So, yeah, that's another one of the issues with it has been that we don't know the date of the meeting sometimes when we're here at this meeting. So it's hard to have people commit to that, you know, uh, no floating date. date. <laughs> um, so that is an issue, but uh, yes, I mean, if I see uh, an opportunity, I'll forward it on to the commission to get it to you all as fast as possible. Um, Can you get them the same time I do? Or? I should. It, okay. we're, we're all going to be, um, yeah, signed up for the same uh, alerts um, from the planning commission. Um, yeah, we can um, see what we can do on the on the knowing the dates thing better, but it is sometimes I don't even know that until. Uh, yeah, that. I mean, I signed up for the Clarendon Presbyterian one and it's still not scheduled. And I think October was when like yeah, it's or September. Yeah. Pushed. yeah, so I have no idea when that will be and it could be. You know, some random date. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, uh, unfortunately, not a lot of transparency in that process. Um, either, in addition to not knowing the dates in advance, like no one says, like, oh, it'll likely be this. It's just like we'll tell you when we're ready to tell you, which would be great if it changed. Um, but I think that's planning staff that we'd have to convince to be more transparent. Um, uh anything else on that before we we move on to some of the next items okay <clears throat> um working with the county board and staff to maintain a full commission so we're down we have two vacancies right now um i'm interviewing some folks for sort of if you have anyone that you think would be a good fit please apply <laughs> um because it's good to have more candidates and um so hopefully at least one of the slots can be filled the next month. Um, uh, yeah, we'll see about the, the, the spot. Um, and I think the last one is like self-explanatory about working with the community to listen to diverse ideas. So that's the maintaining our role and strengthening our role as the chief advisory commission on housing issues. Um, for policy, this is really the one that changes the most from year to year, I feel like. Um, so uh, for this year, uh, monitoring implementation of basically missing middle, um, I think is gonna be key as we see what starts to happen. So they approved over how many applications so far? 24 or something or? It was a lot less than what they could have approved thus far. But I think there just haven't haven't been that many applications. But that's it's very low. That's what we're seeing. Or what? The flood of so flood. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, the entire oh my county is going to be truthfully. It doesn't surprise me, but I think it's much less than the cap that everybody was concerned yes, about. Yeah, I'm afraid of. Yeah. <laughs> I think the cap was more like I had ideological issues yeah. with it rather than trying. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, so monitoring that, seeing what's happening. Um, also related to that, I think this year staff is working on the whole like related thing for enhanced housing opportunities that the board asked staff to to study. I think that is supposed to come out this year. Um, so that's part of this. Um, the redevelopment of financing of Barcroft that's, I think, finishing the uh, or no like in, implementing the master finance plan barcroft um and starting the redevelopment this year is going to be key <clears throat> um this is the same as last year but continuing the you know affordable home ownership efforts um and Karen and i were talking to we give an update now or later uh later um but yeah uh, continuing that subcommittee process and eventually the report will come out with a recommendation and on that um the housing grants program my understanding is that that comprehensive review that took last year is supposed to become public this year 
Um, so I think once it does, we'd like to weigh in on that as well and, and be informed and updated. Um, I think it's done. I think, wasn't it they wanted to wait until the budget, like season to present or something? Or I kept asking for, can they come brief us? Can they come brief us? And the answer was always later, later. Um, but I think, I think this year they're supposed to release it. But um, so when that does drop, that'll be significant. Um, <clears throat> modern day implementation of the regional fair housing plan that was put last year. Um, there's so many things to that plan. Um, so just following up with the county, making sure that things are moving forward, seeing how we can help with that. Um, and there are a number of things that uh, Anne Venetia said that the Housing Commission could help um, with staff uh, developing a better sense of how to move forward with some of the the strategies and goals that were in there. Um, I added this one, uh, provide recommendations to increase engagement with low income and historically marginalized populations in the development of county housing policy and plans, including the SBRC process. Um, I think we talked about last year, like I would get very frustrated with SBRCs where you had existing, um, existing market rate units that were low income, um, being redeveloped and you didn't have any of those tenants at the table with all other people or like the homeowners who lived across the street had a seat at the table. I was like, why aren't the people who are actually having their home torn down and replaced like sitting here and talking about their perspective? And um, so I think continuing to push for the county figuring out how to include um, those residents in decision making processes as much as they can and having us recommend the best ways to do that. Um, I think we should continue to try to do this year. Uh, this one stayed from last year, the review and monitoring of the county eviction prevention efforts. Um, I think it continues to be important. Um, this one is new, um, or sort of a mix of old and new. Examining opportunities to increase the supply of affordable housing. Um, and so as part of this, re-examining the affordable housing ordinance and associated Virginia statute, that was in there in some fashion last year as well. Um, Examining opportunities to streamline and reduce bureaucratic burdens on the development slash redevelopment of affordable housing properties. Uh, that was in there last year as well. Um, collecting information about affordable housing production best practices from surrounding jurisdictions to consider implementation of Arlington. That's new. Um, I'm having discussions with the board and other folks to try to figure out the best way to tackle some of this and what what would be the best sort of outcome or format that the board would like to see some of this information. So stay tuned. I'm hoping in February I can come back to the commission with <clears throat> this is kind of the proposal, um, but I don't have, it's not a place yet where I can really uh, talk definitively about what that could look like. Um, well, in terms of the um, collecting information yeah. about best practice, is that something where you could go up to some of those um, advocacy groups like the HS or like, you know, to because they seem to be pretty expert on. Something. Yeah, yeah, and I think one of the things that would be helpful to look at if we can is what does affordable housing development look like in Fairfax, in Alexandria, in Montgomery County, in other places? Is it cheaper? Is it faster? Um, are there things that we can learn from other jurisdictions? And even just having conversations with HC, APA, and Wesley because they all work in other jurisdictions in addition to Arlington um, and just seeing are there best practices that we can implement here to make this cheaper and faster. Is um, that something we could consider in conjunction with like, I don't know if it's a planning commission or yeah. someone else? I guess they feel like that is part of the your nonprofit partners and others could probably have some pretty concrete ideas. Yeah. Um, but if we're just writing them down and sharing them with no we need to share them with people that can actually like. Yes. Yeah. Right. If no one's going to implement anything. Yeah. It's so not that's important. one of the series of meetings that I'm trying to have to discuss this is with the planning commission to see because uh, I would like to do all this in collaboration with them mm -hmm. um, and see. It would have what, a lot more weight to it. What could that look like? Um, yeah. Hopefully, again, by our next meeting, I'll have much more definitive like, OK, this is what we can. When you say affordable housing, are you just talking about rental or are you talking about homeownership? 
for this, I was just thinking uh, rental. I was not thinking home ownership. <laughs> Since we have a separate home ownership effort, um, uh, yeah, were you thinking that? No, I, I, I thought it was rental, but it's not clear. I can make it, I can make that change <laughs> uh, of affordable rental housing. Do we know other another just general policy question? Other kind of bigger um, like long range plans or like land use plans that are coming down the pike? Um, I feel like a lot of this is oversight monitoring, which isn't bad, but I feel like like the plan Langston and the missing middle and stuff like that are really the big impact like moments we can have also. So I was just curious if we could get any of, if there was any or if we could get any of those like specifically in there. So which is probably a staff question, I realize. Oh. Available because the this planning work plan is available um, to the public, but I'm I'm not sure what that next planning document would be that's in the queue. I'd reached out to Ann Benicia and asked like what is what are the top priorities yeah, right. for staff, and she said that um, implementation of the fair housing plan, um, Crystal Houses. Uh, uh missing middle implementation so part of this did come from like you know that exchange that i had with Anne. um and i think there was one other barcroft Bar yep was so i think a lot of the focus this year is implementing the things that were passed last year um that's yeah um as opposed to like other than home ownership which was the other kind of like big thing that she mentioned um that's right. I guess not that. every year has like these huge, like monumental 40 year plans yeah. that, that come up. Um, also, I have to comment reinstating annual field trips. I'm pretty sure I've been on the commission five years and I've never been on a field trip. So, this yeah, is so back. <laughs> it got added last year okay. and it was COVID interrupted yeah, a lot of potential. I forgot about it, honestly. So, I didn't end up doing anything. I think we talked about it at the beginning of the year and then we looked into doing a meeting at one of the properties, but it, oh, didn't, yeah. it didn't work we were gonna out have a, try to have the wrong. technical uh, yeah, yeah. aspect. And then there, there are also security concerns from the property management themselves with having a bunch of citizens that don't live on the property coming in and out after hours. Um, so those were two of the big uh, concerns based with having a meeting not in one of the typical county buildings. I have to say, when I was at the um, governor's housing conference, not 23, but 22, they did a field trip and it was really fun. Um, we got stuck in traffic, but but if I don't know if we can piggyback if I don't know where the next when the next governor's housing conference, because it does take a lot of work to um, coordinate those field trips yeah. where you go to different affordable um, housing developments and then you have somebody that actually talks to the group and it was a I think the challenge for us is like technically it's a meeting. Yeah. You know, if there's so more than don't do that publicly. Yeah. I know because it would be a great yeah. house. Um, and they go to at least talk with one of the service providers that they fund. Um, so somehow they pulled it off. Yeah. Um, so I said talk to Sintech. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, talk to the maybe. I will also say that. I, I do oversight professionally as well. You can't conduct good oversight unless you're actually on the ground looking at things. Um, so I don't know if that, I, I completely understand the, the constraints that exist, but if there's any way to modify them, I mean, it would be extremely helpful. I mean, I know we can individually, you know, go to sites and, you know, uh, we could reach out to whomever the um, the owner or the property manager is and request a tour or something, but um, it just gets more complicated when it's more than two of us and then public notice. And mm -hmm. it's, um, but we'll look into it. We'll figure out how to make it work and hopefully we can have that happen this year. That can be helpful for you. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, Mr. Chair, this, this uh, is Alice. May I make a comment? Oh. oh. Alice. Uh, sure, Alice. Um, thanks. I think you guys know I was on the commission for many, many years and we did do field trips and it was great. Um, and I, if I recall correctly, what we did to um, work around the uh, meeting problem was that we would have it sort of optional gathering before. So maybe 6 p.m. at another location 
or 5.30 or whatever. And then once that was done, folks would make their way back to the room you're in now and have the regular official meeting. Um, so, for example, I remember one time we went through the shelter, the 24, you know, path forward shelter across the street. Um, and to keep it simple, you could certainly think of there's plenty of affordability, right, uh, you know, walkable to this location, um, you know, between APA, AHC, Wesley. So maybe, you know, something very close and convenient might work prior to your seven o'clock, like official start. Virginia's public meeting laws, but that's in other states. That's it. That's how they okay. do. Things. You have to be very careful because you could get up to some crazy stuff if we're allowed to go off and it's no selling. Who would give up? <laughs> it's an advisory commission with no actual authority to do right. anything. Exactly. <laughs> it all has to be public. <clears throat> you could make a recommendation that people weren't aware of yet. Um, but okay. Uh, the bullet right before that, examining the intersection of Arlington's climate policy and housing policy to include collaborating with C2E2. Um, so this came from uh, your suggestion. Thank you. um, uh, yeah, so that's that's what we have for policy. Does anyone feel like things are missing or things shouldn't be there? Can I just elaborate on the one that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I, yeah, I thought it would be really cool if we could start. Um, working with them, the C2E Commission, ideally also with the Planning Commission, because I know they have like a lot of power on this. But um, I noticed below, it does say collaboration and it lists a bunch of different commissions. I was wondering if we could add the C2E Commission as if we are aspiring, if we do want to aspire to like, collaborate with them. Uh, I don't have an issue with adding them. I don't know a lot about how they work or the types of things that come before them, um, but I'm open to collaborating. Like, yeah, I'm I'm fine with adding. Where are they again? They're the environmental and climate. Like, like climate change, environment, energy. I think it's two two C's and two. Energy. <laughs> yeah, it's like what? Um. A question about yeah. this. Not uh, maybe it should be for the schedule, but like. I feel like I never got a good understanding of like the subcommittees and like if we can leverage those because I feel like we talked a little bit already about how like things often get pushed and I feel like for some of this like best practices work or like collaboration with other. So yeah, with the subcommittees, we used to have bricks and mortar uh, trends, tools and trends, and then there was one more. Uh, There's a partnership okay. with. I think there's only three since I've been around. Really? Okay. Works more. Oh, housing services. Accessory unit. Okay. Um, so right now we just have um, home ownership. Um, previously we had the case of the Serrano one, the, the joint, you know, subcommittee. Um, I, if people really want to bring back like one or more of the subcommittees, we can do that. I'm hesitant for standing committees that just require more meetings and time for people to show up to. And then what I saw happen often is that people couldn't attend a subcommittee meeting. We get to the full commission meeting and they're asking all the same questions they would have asked. And then people get frustrated and upset and they're like, you should have come to the subcommittee meeting. It's like, I couldn't, like I didn't have time to go there. So <clears throat> the attendance was not great. Yes. It was, it was like three people would show up. Yeah. So I'm really hesitant to, to do like the standing ones and say like, oh, all site plans are going to go through bricks and mortar before they come to us because that will reduce our discussion because I don't think it actually will. I'm much more into like if we have <clears throat> like if we want to create a subcommittee that's going to look at the affordable housing ordinance and, you know, we have a set deadline for we're going to produce a report that does like this or like home ownership where like you're moving towards something. That's my preference as opposed to like the standing ones. Um, but if people have other thoughts and they think that, you know, I've also thought about, and again, I hope to be able to bring this back to the commission 
in February, like a fair housing one to look at some of the specific areas that like Aunt Benicia said that we can help staff in implementation of the plan. And um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I want to come back to you all with my recommendation on what I think that should be in February. I don't have that yet. Um, but if other people have recommendations for subcommittees or task forces, they think would add value to the commission. Um, you know, happy to discuss that, but it's just the standing ones. I don't, I just don't see them adding a ton of value. Um, that's my thought. That makes sense. I think I was just thinking about like, I've only been on a commission for a year, but like just thinking about how the meetings go and just knowing how like the research will need to do for best practices and like the discussion required, like I'm just not sure like we have the time right now to fit it into like current agendas. That's really my thought process. I hear what you're saying. I just feel like it wasn't necessarily faster before. Um, I think part of it is if we institute presentation time limits, um, and if I get more like you know, oh, you've already asked your question and I'm going to move on to someone else and, and then we're done with this topic, which I hate doing, which is why our meetings tend to go long because I, you know, but I can do that if people want like, hey, we're going to be out of here two hours no matter what. Um, I can enforce time limits and just be like, nope, no more discussion. We're done. We're ready for a vote. Um, just hate that. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing about the subcommittees is that they do require staff. Okay. So you yeah. have to get somebody to. Okay. They have to be announced. Okay. Agenda. Thank you. Okay. It's like the yeah. whole. It is just a mini meeting of our commission. Um, and yeah. So well, I just maybe remember. Something like best practices, like we could bring in, like, other, like it wouldn't have to be us researching. Maybe we bring in, like, experts in this field or something. I don't know. Maybe we can just think about, like, what that means for us. And so it's not, I, because I definitely hear you also, like, okay, everyone, here's your homework assignment. Yeah. yeah. It, like we did that with legislative priorities. And I thought yeah. that worked out well. Yeah. Yeah. And it was for a specific, like, hey, we want to spend more time on this topic. We're gonna have a separate like subcommittee meeting or something for yeah. it. Yeah. Those work. Yeah. I, I think that's great. And I think that was a successful example of that. It's just the standing ones. I think it just takes, you know, more time and effort. You have to have separate chairs of that too. Um, people commit to like, yes, I will be chairing this, like whenever it is yeah no, that makes sense and for me personally i i don't mind the meetings go over if we're going over like unique information or unique questions but i get i don't want to say frustrated but i guess for lack of a better word is when we kind of are going over the same thing like every meeting um or if it's something that we already have the information for it's like there could be like better use of our time um so but i think we've discussed some ways that we can like put in some efficiency and I'm always open. I mean, if people have ideas like, you know, last year someone recommended the break. Like if we do have a longer meeting, can we take like a bathroom break or something? You know, happy to do things like that. Um, we're going to add times to the agenda. I think that was a great suggestion. Um, so if there's other things that people have and it doesn't have to just be now, it could be at any point in the year about, hey, I think things would be more efficient if we did it this way or more effective. Um, you know, please let me know. Um, uh, more clarified question. Um, so say we do happen to like do our own homework and find out about some sort of best practice. Are we allowed to email the whole committee and give information or is that like supposed to be like public record kind of? Technically, technically okay. you're not allowed to. Technically, uh, if an email sent from one of you to the rest of you, it's a it's a private meeting that the public okay. doesn't have access to. OK, um, so. When you're actually replying, you're supposed to just kind of reply to me and CC Kellen. Um, that is the, the law, unfortunately. Well, that is an interpretation of the law that some of our lawyers have taken because that is not how every jurisdiction does it. And not even all commissions, because some commissions are like, as long as it's not within an hour and you reply back, it doesn't constitute a meeting because it's not like an immediate exchange of ideas and information. So it just depends on the lawyer you talk to um okay. how they interpret it Good but now. yeah in general we're not supposed to be sending a ton of back and forth information through email. um and also anything where you discuss commission business just a reminder is foyable so um 
your and that includes your Gmail, your personal emails. Um, someone could submit a request. So just be aware. Try not to bad mouth a bunch of people <laughs> in your emails about commission business because it could it could go <laughs> generally. <laughs> in reference to sort of a lot of the references in here of like provide recommendations or yeah. stuff. Um, how much of that is potentially impeding what staff does? Um, and so, for instance, like I would not be surprised if staff has had discussions with other jurisdictions and things like that. So I just wondered, it, not that we shouldn't have it here, mm -hmm. but whether that should be coordinated so that we're not necessarily duplicating what staff has really done. Um, sometimes staff has done that. Other times they're they're like, it's not our work plan. It sounds like a great idea, but we don't have the time or resources to put towards that. Um, and so we can sort of fill that gap. Uh, other times staff may come to different conclusions that we, you know, looking at the same information, we're like, well, we think that there should be a different result from this. But whatever we would do, I'd want to coordinate with staff so that, like, if they say, hey, Cal, we already did all this, like, with the affordable housing ordinance, you know, staff has a whole report about it. Um, if we do end up looking into that this year in an official sort of capacity, we're going to be leveraging what staff's done, what outside groups have already done. Yeah, that's um, why I just wanted to make yeah. sure that we were, not that we would analyze it in the same but we didn't need to collect it if they'd already collected. Yeah. So. Well, and part of that too is asking staff to present to us on what okay. they may have already found related to this. Like, hey, staff, have you already looked at this? If so, can you present to the commission on what you found? Um, and then we can take that information and decide what we want to do um, or if we want to make a recommendation. I have a thought on schedule as well, or maybe I'd just be interested in what other people think. But I think um, in past years and one I really appreciated last year was some like educational stuff that was in here. That's not just like our recommendations or like even like voting on site plans here in Arlington, but like when um, Russell and Melissa did like the thing on bonus density, like that was yeah, really yeah, yeah. I never okay. no, I've lived here and developed stuff here, and I never knew any of that. So I really appreciated that. So I don't know if there would be topics like affordable housing finance, um, you know, Virginia housing tax credits, other stuff that would be like valuable not just like as a one-time thing but you'd be able to take that information across and in, when you're learning about other projects uh so well, i'm sure there's others and that just to piggyback on that so for instance like when the commission has presentations like that that are educational that somehow we can mark them so that if new people join the commission and they want to be, like somebody joined like right after they did the presentation, but they didn't have the presentation, then they know to go listen to that meeting. So I do tell all the new and no, I told them that I watched okay. the vote. Okay, okay. okay. Go watch the okay. March okay. and watch the September um you know okay. presentation from staff okay. bonus and, okay. and I do yeah. say that the the new staff okay. or new staff. Well somehow if we can sort of codify that mm -hmm. practice. Yeah. Well and that's the thing people um, have brought up handy. Do we have onboarding materials? Yeah, we don't. Right. I would love yes. to create some. But I have some amazing. stuff. I don't know where it came from, but I have I like a, I found stuff the other day. It's like a list of like a glossary. And I was yeah. looking at it going, wow, this is great. It, if yeah. anyone has I'll, materials I'll, like that, I'll, please I'll, send them out to myself because it would we should exactly. have onboarding information for new commissioners. So it's not just like I don't yeah. know. Listen yeah. and figure yeah. it out. So, right, like um, the terminology. You can take yeah. slides that were presented it's like a, part of the yeah. meetings. Yeah. Yeah. And a little binder or yeah. an yeah. intro brief. Yeah. Be super yeah. useful. Yeah. Um, and I can also be happy to help with any of that. So we can add. Uh, yeah. I think this would fall oh, under. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maintaining strengthening our role as chief advisory commission of the county board and how to use, like basically like improving our own commission and expertise. Um, so I think the education presentations and talking to staff, because staff were the ones last year who decided there's a bunch of new people who clearly don't understand the affordable housing ordinance super well. Yeah. So why don't we present to you all and 
they were like, hey, you know, Kyle, we're going to do this presentation. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay. So, and same thing with Bodhisattva, like they decided like listening to the discussions, I think some education is probably warranted here. So if there's other topics that people think would be very helpful or if staff thinks like would be helpful, I'm happy to have that conversation with them and, and see if we can start planning that out. Um, I think that's a really good suggestion and also coming up with some materials. Also, if there's anyone who would like to help with the, especially the onboarding piece so that it's not just me who has to put everything together, that would be great. Um, Cause some of this is limited by like, what is my capacity to like, do this stuff. Awesome. Um, Alice, to answer your question, so not specifically from housing staff, there is like a new commissioner's orientation that um, covers things more broadly, um, but there isn't currently a binder, um, you know, put together with all the housing info, but I think that's um kind of what we've been discussing last few when i joined in 2020 joe gave out like a white binder everything about the commission and all oh, this yeah he well, had it like i did not get that I, I oh you didn't get it oh yeah i got that binder. <laughs> <laughs> uh well we'll if you have the binder I have to go look at my storage, but I will. If I can, <laughs> it's in my storage. Oh, but I'll get yeah. it. I'll bring it the uh, meeting out here. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, if anyone does have it. materials, please send them up. And well, if you could talk to Joel, just yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be super helpful. Um, okay. Uh, for collaboration, um, just. The number of commissions in the first bullet has expanded um, from like pre previous years. So we still have SITSAC, Senate Landlord Commission, uh, Human Rights Commission, Planning Commission. Um, I added in Disability Advisory Commission. We already have good coverage with Doris. Anyway, she's our representative for that. Um, I added Commission on Aging because they have a housing committee and they I met with them last year and they were like, yeah, we want to collaborate more and all this. I was like, yeah, great, like let's do it. So. Um, I think Commission on Aging, there are certain things that I, I hope we can work more closely on. Um, other things that I've learned recently is like the Planning Commission has a liaison to the Housing Commission. Like oh, news to me, I don't know. That that that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there is Eric. one. Like, Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Here's your liaison. But, and I had asked Alex, like, is there a way to, to kind of pull the other commissions to see who else in theory has a liaison to our commission and you know can we start leveraging that because um apparently there are commissions that have liaisons to us other than disability um and i was never aware and i don't know that they're super active in that function but um well but so i'm i'm a liaison to sitsack yeah. for us so i assume i consider that reciprocal <laughs> <laughs> but are there are there any there aren't any others. I am unaware of any oh, other okay. than Doris. And it's on. Yeah, is she an official? OK, so we know that the, at least we know that the two sits back and. So how do we make them official? And apparently planning. Um, that's something. For, maybe for, in their charter or something that they. Are you, and the board like approves you, right? Like the board approves you as the yeah, liaison. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that, that was news to me because yeah, the, uh, the only reason this happened was because Eric had said, "Hey, we need yeah, you got to be a you got to be on a committee or you got to be a liaison." And so I said, "Okay, liaison." And then when I got to SITSAC, they said, "Oh, by the way, this makes you an official thing." So which was a um, but so. I don't know, maybe there are other officials. So that's, I I want to work with Alex to look into and answer those questions. Um, and also, are there ones where we should have an official well, liaison? Well, that's what I, I thought at a minimum out of this list. I think there should be an official connection. I think that makes sense. Um, could we do, I mean, I talked to, like, uh, like last year, I talked to David Tim, their chair, you know, fairly frequently. 
Um, and I talked to the planning commission chair, and I talked to Eric Hall, uh, who's <laughs> kind of like the unofficial liaison to the planning commission, just because um, he was our chair. Uh, no, 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 but and and have some sort of relationship with COCC. What is that? that is, um, yeah, is the acknowledge. Now I gotta remember. It's the continuum of care. The housing commission. Yes, because I'm it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I. That's another thing I can. And I think as part and of. I the sit program, in so. on because they have the the COC, so the COCC is mostly homeless programs, but um and funding sources for homeless, um, but they have a. It's not the whole COCC. They sit in on it every other. Um, I think it's a housing related piece to the COCC. So we're not talking about like all of their case management stuff and things, which is a little bit beyond yeah. us. So we can figure so, out. So that that is one too. And I, truthfully, I don't know that that one's as useful, um, but it, it is one. So we might as well have it on the list. <laughs> And I think too, as part of onboarding, we should have like position descriptions or like, you know, a defined role. Like, what does it mean to be a liaison to SITSAC? Um, what's expectation? Same thing. So that when someone says, hey, we need a liaison for this, you're like, oh, okay, cool. I'll do it. And then you find out, oh, well, now you have to attend like 15 extra meetings um, because you're the liaison. So, yeah, I think as part of that, we should really define what those, what they are and um, what that role looks like. Um, and then the the next bullet, so working with jurisdictions nearby. Um, so again, Alexandria, like I met with their affordable housing or uh, yeah, Alexandria Housing Affordability Advisory Committee chair last year, um, and we exchanged emails at various points about like certain things that may be of interest to both Fairfax. I haven't been successful. In Do they have a body besides the redevelopment. I think they have something. Um, oh, I'm sure they have. I mean, they've got the advisory to their redevelopment. Maybe. Right, they have a board for that. As I was curious if they had anything else. Um, but I will put that on my to-do list to figure out what exactly that entity is in Fairfax. I know when I shared the Tenant Landlord Commission, I was trying to work with their Tenant Landlord Relations Board or whatever, and that was unsuccessful. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I will. I'll figure out who our point of contact is supposed to be uh, for Fairfax and how we can work together. Well, and I wonder if that's something that's like more of a um, the ad hoc -y sort of standing with the committee so that it's, um, you know, who would like to this year contact Fairfax or would like to contact. And I think where that matters most. What I've seen is the uh, legislative priorities is if you can work with them, say, hey, we we'll recommend this to our board. If you recommend it to your city council or your you know, board of supervisors, now you have three jurisdictions all with the same recommendation to the General Assembly. It tends to matter more. And we've actually got legislation passed by doing that um, before. Well, and also with the fair housing, because the fair housing is a regional yeah. thing. Um, right, good question. Yep. So say like, um, in terms of like what it looks like to collaborate with the public commission, if it's not official, like an official liaison, like say I want to like collaborate with the C2E2 commission because I'm the chair and we like exchange ideas about, uh, you know, electrifying affordable housing units and things like that. Um, how would I like kind of bring that up to the commission? If, you know, I know I can't email everybody. Would it be something you can request an agenda item? Yeah, you would just go to me and Alex and say like, hey, I've been working on X and Either if it's a presentation from them or it's a resolution that you want to bring forward, you would just say, hey, I'd like this on the agenda. Or they'd be like, cool, let's have a conversation about it. And, you know, let's move forward. Okay. Um, yeah, anyone can do that. Like, if you all have items you want on the agenda, you can just reach out to me and, and request it. Um, and I'm probably not going to just be like, I don't know what this is, but sure. Like, let's talk first. And yeah, um, but there's no restriction on you talking to other commissions and yeah. <laughs> um, and also, if it's like a no, not like a full item, but maybe like a 
two to five minute update but it's something like, I can yeah. throw that under subcommittee reports on the agenda too. So mm -hmm. yeah, just cool. can I ask what that next sentence means exactly? Which one? About the national anthem. Oh, um, that was a carryover from last year. I just changed the year. Um, I think it was still like Amazon. My guess is it probably got added around the time that Amazon, um, you know, had their had second headquarters here. Um, and so I think it's just a shared area, era, area um, both the what, Potomac Yards, um, oh, as well as like National Landing, where we're both like, what's going to happen here? Let's collaborate. Um, if you guys don't feel like that's as relevant, we can take it out. Um, I didn't have an objection to it, so that's why I just kept it in. I was just thinking you have 655 units in the pipeline in that area currently, so I'm just curious. If, or if there was more than just continuing to talk. Yeah, I mean, right now it's like an annual conversation with the <laughs> Alexandria um, chair of their like commission. Um, and so there's, there hasn't been a whole lot more to it. I don't know with the potential stadium plans and impacts that they, they have, if that goes through, like, you know, that could be another area of focus, but yeah. You can subscribe to the Alexandria, City of Alexandria Housing News. You get it all. They send really good emails out and then you can attend their meetings virtually if you wish. If you want to get involved in all that fun stuff. Um, and then for the anticipated schedule, these are just some of the things that I know about. Um, obviously, the agendas will, this will change, but um, we already approved our annual report um, this month. Uh, the work plan we're going to approve next month. <clears throat> then we'll have the budget um, that will be focused on in March. Uh, our legislative priorities, the target is July. I know that got pushed last year. Um, and then I don't know when the homeownership study final report is going to come out, but that's going to be on our agenda at some point. Same thing, the housing grant review findings. Um, and then I this last one I should remove because we don't we don't do this until the beginning of the year. So it doesn't make sense to have the annual report. Um, yeah, so there's not a whole lot of other set agenda items for the rest of the year that I know about right now. Um, I think it's helpful to switch at least the one to sense of what's gonna happen. Um, and then lastly is just the county board meetings. Like I said, I'll send up the sign up genius. Um, do people feel like that worked fairly well last year? And I think Alex, you sent out like meeting invites for you know, invites to each person in that one. I'll follow up with you the week of getting connected with the staff person that has the either the team's info or if you're coming in person, they know your name. We expect you to speak. Uh, okay. So any other things like comments that people have for the, the work plan? I'm sorry, this is kind of minor, but I I would um suggest maybe we move b and c up before a just like switch that order because i i kind of feel like that's more of our role as the housing commission so i just move a down in the order like i thought about that and then but yeah, yeah I, I mean it's i realize it's like formatting um, but yeah i think we can move that to b i think that that's what i would agree with yeah I think it became a right when the Serrano hit. Yeah, and then, it, which makes sense. Yeah, with the context. B would be A, so it would be C. Yep. It would be C. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anything else on this? Yeah. Again, we're not voting on it tonight. It's just taking it every once. Yeah, edit great. the changes yeah. and. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, one more question. Yep. Sorry, last question. <laughs> the, uh, I guess D in the current status, members of the public speaking community in Arlington, what does that just like collaborating with? Yeah, ADS? that was, it was in there before um, and I decided not to remove it because 
sounds like a good thing. I, we don't specifically do anything that I know of with members of the public school community in Arlington, but probably someone at some point thought that was important and asked for it to be included. We can take it out. It was Laura and she's not on it. Oh, was it? Okay. She was before on some sort of school committee. I see. So she came in. So now that Laura's gone, do we want to stop <laughs> I, collaborating with the public school community? Well, I think it was, it, did we really, it didn't yeah, work. <laughs> I don't think it really worked. <laughs> Some of these are aspirational. They're, you know, yeah. we would like to do this if we have time and yeah. You say we have kids at the school? I think, I think it's, I would take it off personally, but if we could somewhere in our mission represent that we're always keeping when looking at projects, always making sure that, that yeah. from a project standpoint, they're collaborating. Okay. If, if particularly if it's a property like our crop. The school system does collaborate. Yes. Yeah. I know this from no, a long, long time ago. And I know they do. That's part of like the relocation and guys yeah. lot of it saying this age. Yeah. Would. So that's what I'm more yeah. concerned of us just making sure comes from the school that system. the impact on school age children is taken into consideration when they do developments with. But I think that's a tenant landlord matter, really. Like that's yeah, it's in the relocation plan. Okay. Yeah. Then I'm I mean, with, I guess that's. Then I'm good with that, but I'm after. It's more so that does come up in their meetings when they discuss the relocation plans. Okay. Like, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I mean, I think I I, I see definitely see that. It could be the reason, but no, I want to say the. She was our latest. I just feel like we got a lot here. Right? Yeah. We we so, got a lot. Yes. <laughs> so that's I, I, why I, I just she, thought that's I, one yeah. thing you could get rid of. <laughs> that yeah, it's the robust yes. uh, work for the year. Um, but again, it's that's great. It's you know, yeah. Well, this is what we man. think is important, yeah. but yeah, um, we're volunteers and we will do the best that we can to execute it. Um, but okay. Um, any other comments or feedback? And if anyone thinks of something, you know, before the February meeting, also let me know. Um, and I'll send out a new, or Alex will send out um, the new version of this prior to that meeting. Um, and then we'll have any last minute changes and then a vote. Okay, uh, next agenda item are uh, development of. One, uh, I have, um, so the county board will consider, consider an amendment to a condition that is part of the Barcroft first renovation phase amendment at the January 20th meeting on its consent agenda. Um, and so this is one that we heard uh, just a few months ago and, and needs a uh, uh, change to it, but. Um, this project is the one to assist with the renovations of the 93 units in this phase. The applicant is pursuing Virginia Housing Senior Financing. The proposed changes to Condition 39 include a revision that if the development is financed with funds from Virginia Housing, and if there is a default under a Virginia Housing Deed of Trust on the property that results in a foreclosure or deed in lieu of foreclosure on the property. At 74 CAFs, where 80% of the total shall not be subject to the affordability restriction. The remaining 19 CAF, or 20% of the total, shall have, shall have rents affordable to households averaging up to 60% area median income for the term of 99 years, less the time elapsed since the original covenant effective as of December 29, 2021. Um, so this percentage of units and level of affordability is consistent with recent site plan projects utilizing both county loan and Virginia housing financing. In the unlikely event a foreclosure or deed in lieu of foreclosure would ever arise, the county would be notified of any detail, any defaults in advance for an intercreditor and subordination agreement with Virginia housing. Uh, the county would therefore have the opportunity to cure the default uh, to avoid a foreclosure. The amendment is a requirement of Virginia housing in a standard language that is part of every CAF development that has utilized Virginia housing for the last 
five years. So it's a very small change to the condition um, to allow for um, Virginia housing financing in the project for Barcroft. So for Barcroft, the total financing or the sources, it wasn't just Amazon in the county. There was additional uh, loans that were taken out for that property. What was the total site? So, no. So it was just oh, the 160 and the 150 million. Yeah. Um, this is more looking at when they break off each phase one at a time, then they're going into Virginia housing for um, financing that piece specifically. Um, so if they, so they, but the county is requiring them to have all of those units be affordable for 99 years, but this is saying that this could supersede that. This would only be for the pieces with Virginia housing financing. Yeah. And it's true, this every single affordable deal in the county has these. Do you have a choice? Is like no. <laughs> no, you do not. Or you're not using Virginia housing yeah. financing in the right. deal. Yeah. Right. But it does, it would supersede on that piece that is financed with Virginia housing. Of course. Foreclosures, what, what, extremely. Only yes, thank you. Only if the property, and how I don't think they've ever foreclosed. And, yeah. And they're giving, even before that, they're giving the county yeah. Yeah. to intercede. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, well, um, that, that's another what he asked. How much was total? Because uh, I hear the 150, 150 billion, then you said 100. So, we, uh, the county put in 150 and Amazon 160 million. And then they got that. more from the This is housing. for the redevelopment. No, it, they're like not peeling the pieces. Yeah, off. It, that it's was all purchase. It's not. Well, that's additional. the 150 was to purchase it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, gotcha. gotcha. This is just the financing of building. the oh, renovations. Renovation. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Um. So that's the um. So if you see something about Barcroft on the uh, consent agenda, um, that's what that is. Um. Other than that, um. I sent out the development update sheet. I um, do have. Alex, is there like a cheat sheet for Crystal Houses that staff can send out to us? Because I get very confused which ones are the ones that the county or that Amazon like purchased through their, you know, whatever, and which ones are like separate, like. I know staff understands it really well. I get very confused as to which is which. Oh, if if they have not just something that can be like, you know, Crystal House six is the Amazon one, and these other ones are the separate thing, and we, yeah, that would be super helpful. Um, yes, I can uh, figure out some sort of uh, handout to distribute on that. Um, but there will be. Um, <laughs> A lot in the next few months. Yeah, uh, with Crystal House coming forward. Both it's really, them. What for both of them or just one? Um, how many Crystal Houses are there? So there's Crystal Houses uh, three, six, and four on uh, technically what's called the big parcel across the street. There is Crystal House five, and that was the one that the land was given to the county. Um. And he'll probably explain all this better than I <laughs> but, but um, that's what if the developer and the TV, county are working on. Be, you just which, want something that like labels which one is which. Yeah. 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 And just, like, it's, it's very illogical. It doesn't go in order. Yeah. Yeah. That would be yes, the one that the county did the RFP for. Yeah. Is the one that like, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there's yeah. a lot of big decision points coming up in that project in the next uh, very short term. So um, more to come on that. This is the one where all of our caps are going from the other project or the money uh, from the affordable housing ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, and then other than that, um, I just have uh, this. I don't know, uh, Nikki, if you had an update on the Goodwill SPRC, there is another one uh, coming up next week, a second one. Um, other than that, we actually have People signed up. Um, I mean, there's the floating dates thing on these two. Um, we did lose Laura. Um, so the Public Facilities Review Committee, uh, we don't have a liaison to that or a representative for that. Um, 
we have been asked to have one. Uh, I'm not sure, you know. Exactly. I'd be interested in that one, be depending on if that's not like an every single month one, is it? Is I, you'll find out. I, <laughs> I raised my hand first. So, <laughs> but, um, okay, okay I, I'll. <laughs> Depending on the commitment, maybe I can split it with someone. But I'm, inter like, I'm interested. I'm interested. Whatever's useful, the rep or the alternate, any of these I just need to look at with this commitment. So yeah, there, there will be probably a, um, a handful of SPRCs that are added to the schedule. And the, the next couple of weeks and months, um, and those are usually the time commitment. Usually, is one or two evenings total. Um, and they said it lasts about an hour and a half. Because, yeah, they're not long. Yeah. Um, it's you just don't know when they are going to be super fun. It's runs it's like this day, um, and they're in the evening too. It's not like they're like around the same time. But once we get yeah. the sometimes around the same day as our Commission meeting of this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can come prepared next meeting with a combined update, but the last Goodwill one was a lot about parking. Oh, <laughs> like the entire week. I guess there's going to be some parking um, like outside. Retail parking. Yeah. And I, a lot of people on the uh, SPRC planning commissioners are not happy about that. Um, I think they would like it to be underground. I guess there's some transportation guidance that Arlington released and the parking that the Goodwill developers have um, proposed like doesn't meet that. They said it takes away from like making it more walkable and safe and things like that, and, like the car free diet stuff. Um, 50. Oh my God, Route but, 50 and Glebe Road, yes, makes more sense. I don't know. Um, and the, the Goodwill <laughs> folks said that like, for the members that they serve, like the people who shop at Goodwill, they want more outside parking. There was a lot of back and forth. But I can come more prepared with a combined update next meeting. I think the next meeting will be more like what we would be concerned about. Yeah, so um, other than that, I'll send out meetings as they come, but uh, we have signed up for the ones on the calendar now. So. I'm good there. That's it for development updates. Thank you. Um, next is subcommittee reports, which I think is just home ownership. Um, so we have not met. Um, uh, we are hopefully going to meet either end of January, beginning of February. Um, right now, the um, home ownership report is in a draft form. And it's being reviewed by staff and we have a new CPHD director. So that has actually um, Slow the process down a little bit. Am I saying something bad? No, it just it got slowed down because we have a new CPHD director. So Everyone knows wait. that is right. Samia Bird is the yes. director of CPHD. So okay. hopefully, next time we meet, I will be able to. Um, something will have happened. Where what does CPHD stand for? Be planning, housing, and development. It's Alex's boss. It's planning, housing. Mm -hmm. Development, but it also has like uh, inspection, zoning. Okay. Um, do you know is <clears throat> our staff looking at because Amazon is doing that forty million dollars for affordable home ownership, um, and I guess the Community Land Trust, the Virginia Y Community Land Trust, applied to use some of those fundings for it included Arlington. Do you know is staff talking to that like any way of looking at that as part of I they're looking for the sun? No okay. idea what the report says. It's a secret until I see it. Okay. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that are involved. There's a third party consultant, you know, and it, they're completely vetting this whole thing yep. before it's released. Okay. I was just gonna Yeah, so um, SIDSAC is the Community Development Citizens Advisory Commission. Um, <laughs> uh, I had to do that. 
So we had a presentation at the last meeting uh, from the city manager's office that they just put out um, a NOFA for uh, a new program. So apparently city manager's office had sort of um, had a certain pot of general fund money that they just said part of it was contracts with folks like Path Forward and I remember the other one that are basically always no, but that are entities that basically do what the government could or should do, but they've contracted it out. So, and that is a separate pot of funding. But then there's also other um, nonprofits in the community that have just traditionally always gotten funding from the general fund. Um, well, apparently the city manager's office in the last year or so decided that um, at least some of that should be turned into discretionary money and put out competitively. And so that's um, a million five that went out that was normally, it's the same budget, but they just carved off 3.5 million to put out competitively for the nonprofits to then um, So um, that's just a new thing. It's called race and it's called rebuilding trust and community NOFA. And I you don't know, couldn't really figure out why it was called building trust. I think it's because this used to kind of be like the commission, the board's slush. I mean, people didn't use that terminology, <laughs> which is probably not really to use that terminology, but anyway. Um, and so this, I think, why the rebuilding trust is to try and put more transparency um, structure to some of the funding. So, yeah. just FYI, having previously sat on the board of one of those nonprofits that just was given a contract, yeah, I was kind of appalled doing procurement for the federal government. Like, just oh, you have no safeguards in here. Like, this is not how you're supposed to run a contract. And right. yeah, our procurement shop was just like, yeah, whatever. like now yeah. I will say mm. that interestingly enough. And the other cool piece that I think kind of goes on to our work sort of along the lines of the work plan is, is it's that they've gone out to the community and solicited reviewers for these application for these proposals and try very, very hard to get reviewers that reflect the people that are being served by these nonprofits and they're paying them, which is situation, but that's also why they're hopefully being a little bit more successful in who they're gathering to do that. So there's a little bit more of that community voice and involvement in this little piece. So it's a good start. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's a completely unstructured situation. So we were all, all of us who on SIDSAC has like a really big grants review process that is very structured. It's partially dictated by the feds. But anyway, um, we were like, wait a minute, we're like, you have none of these pieces. So it is a little unstructured, but this is their first year. So anyway. Uh, any other days on updates? <laughs> okay. Um, then I think that's it for our meetings. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.